think I can officially say good afternoon, everyone. Yes, 12.02, so good afternoon. Uh, I don't have my watch. Uh, so. <laughs> Take it on well, we're on, the, we're on the, as always, on the same on the time. Same yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Vivian, Foreign Minister, it's wonderful uh, to have you here at, uh, at the State Department. We have uh, actually worked closely together since the last time uh, I was in government, and I value the, the conversations we've had over many years. And one of the things that um, I can say uh, very clearly is that um, Every time I have an opportunity to spend time with the Foreign Minister, uh, I learn something, and I'm grateful for that. Um, Singapore is, for the United States, a true partner. And having the opportunity today to discuss so many issues that bring us together regionally, bilaterally in the first instance regionally, but also globally, uh, was very, very beneficial. Um, but if I could, uh, Vivian, let me just begin um, with a few words about my upcoming visit to the People's Republic of China, since we're leaving tonight on that, uh, on that trip. Um, we look forward to having a series of meetings with senior officials in Beijing, building on the engagements that we've had uh, with the PRC since President Biden and President Xi met in Bali late last year. And to summarize it, the trip has three objectives. First, to establish open and empowered communications uh, so that our two countries responsibly manage our relationship, including by discussing challenges, by addressing misperceptions, and avoiding miscalculations. Second, to advance U.S. interests and values and those we share with allies and partners around the world, including speaking directly and candidly uh, about our very real concerns on a range of issues. And third, to explore the potential for cooperation on transnational challenges, global economic stability, illicit synthetic drugs, climate, global health, uh, where our country's interests intersect and the rest of the world expects us to cooperate. Intense competition requires sustained diplomacy to ensure that competition does not veer into confrontation or conflict. And again, that is what the world expects of both the United States and China. Now, our friends in Singapore and Southeast Asia more broadly are essential to realizing what is a shared vision for a free, an open, a prosperous, a secure, a connected, a resilient Indo-Pacific, where people, where goods, where ideas can travel freely, where rules are applied fairly and transparently. Uh, and indeed, for six decades now, the strategic partnership between the United States and Singapore, rooted in respect for the rules-based international order, has helped strengthen peace and stability in the region and around the world. Um, I reaffirmed to the Foreign Minister that ASEAN is at the heart of our Indo-Pacific strategy. The United States supports ASEAN centrality, and we see a considerable convergence between our own Indo-Pacific strategy and ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific, epitomized by a shared belief in inclusive economic growth, transparency, and the rule of law. Consistently stood up for Ukraine's sovereignty. And partners in enacting sanctions that are taking a toll on Russia's war machine. And we'll continue to support Ukraine as we work toward a just and lasting peace, one based on the principles that I laid out recently in Helsinki. Respect for human rights and self determination are also being challenged in Burma where the military's coup and the brutal crackdown continues to harm civilians, to deprive them of their right to choose their own path, and threatens regional stability. We appreciate Singapore and ASEAN's critical role in seeking a peaceful solution. The United States will continue to impose strong sanctions uh, against those perpetrating atrocities. We welcome Singapore's partnership in maintaining the necessary economic pressure. Our two countries are also seizing new opportunities uh, to work together, from space and cyber to supply chain resiliency to clean energy. And we spent some time, some time talking about that. Uh, as part of the Green Shipping Challenge launched at COP27 last year, Singapore recently announced an MOU uh, with the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach to upgrade digital infrastructure and to reduce emissions. We're partnering to advance our clean energy across ASEAN 
uh, including the ASEAN Power Grid, which will facilitate renewable energy development and deployment throughout the region and help Singapore transition to net zero emissions by 2050. And as part of our expanded U.S.-Singapore climate change partnership, we've annou we're announcing today new and enhanced areas of cooperation from reducing deforestation to encouraging energy efficient buildings. All this collaboration is rooted in one of our strongest bilateral relationships in the Indo-Pacific. American companies, we talked about this as well, are the largest source of foreign direct investment in Singapore. We're working to grow our economies even faster and even fairer through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, of which Singapore was an early and enthusiastic supporter. Singapore is also a critical security partner, hosting American ships and aircraft, sending pilots to train in the skies above Arizona and Idaho. And for evidence of our robust people-to-people -people ties, one need look uh, only, for example, at Singapore's cabinet, where over half the ministers, including Prime Minister Lee, have studied in the United States. Uh, President Jacob is also a distinguished alum of the State Department's International Visitors Leadership Program, proving that hmm, we have a pretty good eye for talent. <laughs> uh, recently, the Prime Minister urged the people of Singapore, and I quote, to think boldly, to aim high, to seek far. Those are wise and powerful words, and I look forward to that spirit continuing to guide the close partnership between Singapore and the United States. Vivian. Thank you, Tony. It's always special to meet you here. I think we've been meeting regularly for about seven years, including different incarnations. But, you know, and so I will confess to being biased, but I think the United States is very blessed to have the ultimate consummate diplomat in you, and more so at these very testing, trying, and challenging times. So it's an honor to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss a wide range of issues just now. We first reaffirm the excellent, long-standing, close, stable relationship between the United States and Singapore. And I should add our shared commitment to a rules-based international order and the fact that it was the United States seven, eight decades ago which in fact envisioned, underwrote and supported this rules-based international order. And even now as we go through challenging times, I think we need to reaffirm the importance of such a system. We also covered a range of bilateral, regional, and global issues. I think on the bilateral front, everyone knows that we've got a very robust economic relationship. And of course, we are in that special category which you defined as a major security cooperation partner of the United States. But we haven't stood still. We're also expanding into new frontiers. Uh, you've just mentioned the upgrade, updated United States-Singapore Climate Partnership, and this will focus on collaboration in five areas, including the regional energy transition in Southeast Asia, and also low and zero emission solutions. So watch this space, there's a lot happening. We are also working in other areas like cybersecurity, all the more pertinent now with the challenges that we're facing. And also, we, we also signed the Artemis Accord yeah. last year. So that's another whole new frontier for collaboration. Uh, I mentioned just now that, we, in fact, for 33 years, we've had the Memorandum of Understanding regarding the United States' use of our facilities at both naval and aviation. Again, that has been a symbol of our belief that the United States' strategic presence and contribution to our part of the world has provided stability, has provided opportunity, and helped to underwrite the peace, which we should never take for granted. Uh, Singapore is home today to over 5,700 United States companies, and I also made 
the point that the United States investments in Singapore exceed what the United States has invested in Japan, China and the ROK combined. If you consider how small Singapore is, that statistic becomes all the more remarkable. Uh, on the other side of that same equation, uh, Singapore's investments into the United States and, and U.S. exports to Singapore, in fact, support more than 250,000 jobs in America itself. So I know it's not just about trade for its own sake, but also in terms of jobs and opportunities for people on both sides. I also wanted to commend uh, the very active regional engagement under President Biden's administration and with your shepherding the efforts in our part of the world. The fact that President Biden attended the ASEAN summit in Phnom Penh last year and the President also hosted the ASEAN-US uh, Special Summit in Washington in May last year. That sent a very strong signal of engagement. And we also elevated the ASEAN-US relations to a comprehensive strategic partnership last year. And it's not just a form of words, but the real substance, the real deal. We also look forward to working with you, and you mentioned it just now, to align the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy with the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. And we hope that there will be further discussions, you know, hopefully when the President and you can visit our part of the world uh, for the ASEAN meetings, uh, the EAS summit, the uh, ASEAN-U.S. summit as well either here or in our part of the world in the near future. So I think the point is we do want to reaffirm the importance, the critical importance of the U.S. anchoring your strategic engagement in our part of the world. And I made the point that there is in fact a deep reservoir of goodwill and trust. And you have many partners uh, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Maybe others may not be as explicit as we are in saying how welcome you are, but I gave you the assurance that everyone wants to see you engaged in our part of the world. The IPEF, which we also discuss, is another strong reaffirmation of the U.S. commitment to the economic agenda in Southeast Asia and, no, in fact, the Asia Pacific. We welcome the substantial conclusion of the negotiations on the second pillar of the IPEF and this focuses on supply chains. And we hope that the remaining pillars of the IPEF will include meaningful provisions that will lead to concrete benefits and even greater regional integration. Finally, I know you've got a big visit coming up. Uh, I believe you're leaving tonight. And I wanted to say that we commend your efforts. Uh, this is a very important and critical moment, not just for the United States and China, but indeed the rest of the world will be watching. So we hope and believe that you will be able to manage the differences, but more important, establish open channels of communication, build mutual trust and understanding, and you know, I wish you smooth sailing and a successful uh, visit ahead. So thank you again for hosting me. Thank you for this chance you know, to, as always, have very open, candid, sincere discussions. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take four, four, four questions. First one goes to Simon Lewis with Reuters. Thank you. Um, first to the Foreign Minister, Dr. Balakrishnan. Um, the secretary mentioned that uh, Myanmar um, came up in your in your discussions. I, I wondered um, if I could ask you for Singapore's position on a um, uh, an initiative by the, the caretaker government in Thailand to um, re-engage with Myanmar's military junta um, and reportedly uh, inviting the, the junta back into ASEAN meetings. You know, is that something that Singapore would support? And I'd also be interested in your response to. 
uh, the recent report by the UN Special, Special Rapporteur on, on Myanmar, on human rights in Myanmar, who um, identified uh, $254 million worth of, of uh, goods that have come through Singaporean entities to the Myanmar military. So I'm um, interested in your response to that. And for the Secretary, um, I would also be interested in your, your view on whether ASEAN nations, you know, including Singapore, also Thailand, uh, should be doing more to stop the violence in Myanmar. Um, and, and specifically on Thailand, I wonder if, if, if we could get your view on, on um, efforts to form a new government there. Are you concerned about the Thai military trying to cling on to power despite the clear, uh, pretty clear results of the election? Um, and just an additional one, because it's breaking news. Uh, President Putin has um, said that tactical nuclear weapons have been deployed to, to Belarus. Uh, Secretary, um, what's the US response to that and, and are there consequences for, for Russia and Belarus? Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I think I counted at least three questions. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me get back to first principles. We condemn the coup in Myanmar and the ongoing violence against civilians, the instability in the country, the setback to national reconciliation, and the enormous impact on the economy. Unfortunately, it's now more than two years. We haven't seen any signs of improvement. From an ASEAN perspective, we had the five-point consensus, and we haven't seen any significant progress in fulfilling the five-point consensus. So we believe it would be premature to re-engage uh, with the junta at a summit level or even at a foreign minister level. And in fact, our leaders at the recent ASEAN summit reaffirmed this position. Having said that, uh, the ASEAN chair, Indonesia, is engaging across a wide spectrum of stakeholders. And the key point is this. You do need everyone ultimately to sit down and negotiate. I don't know how long it will take. The last time it took 25 years for some form of democratic transition to occur in Myanmar. I hope it won't take that long. But it's very important for the rest of us, whilst we are in favor of reconciliation, we're in favor of more dialogue, we obviously want to make sure that the level of violence goes down and certainly from Singapore's perspective, our policy is that we should all do our best to make sure arms or even dual use items which can be used to inflict harm and injury on civilians should be proscribed. Uh, I noted uh, Tom Andrews' report and one line in it is worth quoting. And he said that there are no indications that the government of Singapore has approved or is involved in the shipment of arms and associate materials to the Myanmar military, unquote. But more important, we're also engaging Tom Andrews because any specific information which he has access to and which we can use for investigations or if need be to prosecute companies or entities which are breaching our laws and our policies on arms and dual use, uh, rest assured, we will get to the bottom of it. But the bigger question is when will peace come back? Tony, I'm afraid I remain pessimistic. Uh, you can um, sign my name onto every word of what the <laughs> foreign minister just said, including, unfortunately, the uh, pessimism that uh, he expressed at the end, which we share. But everything that um, the minister said, I. Um, I ascribe to as well. Uh, we um, are very focused in supporting ASEAN efforts to move forward toward a, uh, a resolution that uh, ends the violence, that frees uh, people in jail, uh, that puts Burma back on a democratic path. Uh, the five point consensus that uh, the, the junta signed on to has not been, to, say, to state the obvious, uh, uh, advanced, much less met. Uh, and it's very important that we continue, all of us, to sustain the appropriate pressure 
on the junta uh, and look for ways, of course, to engage the um, uh, opposition in, uh, in Burma and find every possible avenue to advance uh, Burma's return to the democratic path to an end to the violence of the freedom of people who've been unjustly imprisoned. Um, and in all of these efforts, we are working, the United States and Singapore, very closely together, both through, through ASEAN, but also on a, on a bilateral basis. Uh, with regard to Thailand, I'd simply say that our full expectation is that the government will be formed pursuant uh, to the uh, laws of, uh, of Thailand. That is, uh, the, that is our expectation. That's the expectation of uh, people in Thailand as well. With regard to the reports about uh, Belarus, um, we've seen comments that were made in the last, uh, in the last few hours. We'll continue to monitor the situation very closely and, and very carefully. We have no reason to adjust our own nuclear posture. Uh, we don't see any indications that Russia is preparing to use a nuclear weapon. The um, President said uh, again this week that we remain committed to the defense of NATO every inch of uh, its territory. So that uh, is our, uh, our North Star. Uh, and we're very focused on that. Um, I would just note that one of President Putin's claims for starting his brutal invasion of Ukraine, one of the many uh, rationales he gave at various points, was ostensibly to prevent the threat of Ukraine reacquiring the nuclear weapons that it gave up when the Soviet Union dissolved, and Ukraine voluntarily gave up the weapons it inherited, along with Belarus and Kazakhstan. Uh, so it would be rather ironic, among many other things, for President Putin uh, to now be talking about putting nuclear weapons on the territory of a neighboring state, again, including a state that gave up the nuclear weapons that it inherited when the Soviet Union dissolved. Um, and as for Belarus itself, this is just another example of Lukashenko making irresponsible, provocative uh, choices to cede control of Belarus's sovereignty against the will of the Belarusian people. Next, next question goes to Nirmal Ghosh with the Straits Times. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, you have spoken about um, uh, the new frontiers in the relationship with the United States. Could you elaborate a bit on that? You, know, you mentioned the climate partnership, cybersecurity, and so forth. A few more specifics, if you could share. And secondly, as has been mentioned, a lot of the world is watching the Secretary's uh, forthcoming visit to China. I wonder if you could give us a Singapore uh, and or Southeast Asian view of US-China relations. And Mr. Secretary, if you could also speak to that latter part about, again, about ASEAN centrality mm -hmm. and how it all fits into the Indo-Pacific strategy. Well, thank you, Dama. Uh, you know, I used to be the Minister of Environment before this incarnation, mm -hmm. so I was heavily involved with the final negotiations for the Paris Agreement. And one observation which I will make is that we would not have arrived at the agreement in Paris if it hadn't been for the confluence of strategic and environmental interests of the United States and China. And I can tell you that from direct experience. Um, and in a sense, that's why tonight's trip is so important, because there are many global planetary issues. Climate pandemics, even cybersecurity, which require the United States and China to work off the same page and be key pillars for a global system which will help increase resilience to threats to welfare, health, and prosperity for people all over the world. So you, know, you, you go with our full support. But having said that, you know, speaking now as a diplomat, I, you know, I want to make this plea. But please don't put too much weight on poor Tony's <laughs> shoulders. Uh, you know, the, the fact is diplomats need time and space and sometimes just some quiet time to engage in some honest-to-goodness conversations uh, without having to put out a tweet every hour or two. Uh, the trip is essential, but not sufficient. There are fundamental differences in outlook, in values, 
And it takes time for mutual respect and strategic trust to be built up. So you know, it's important, but I'm also making the plea, I hope people don't have excessive <laughs> expectations on that front. On your question about the new frontiers, I already mentioned the climate uh, partnership. And there are five focal areas under that partnership, which include the regional energy transition, second, low and zero emission uh, technologies and solutions, third, nature-based solutions and carbon markets, and fifth, urban decarbonization, resilience, and capacity building. And even in all these areas, you can see that there's obvious opportunities for synergy and cooperation between the United States and Singapore, not just for our own sake, but in our region as well. I mentioned the Artemis Accords, so outer space is certainly another frontier. And of course, we've been working very closely, especially in the last couple of years, on cybersecurity, because that is a clear and present frontier where there's both risk and opportunity. So watch this space. Tell me. Uh, I'm, uh, as always, tempted to say what he said. <laughs> uh, because once again, I think um, the farm has captured it uh, very, very well uh, on all fronts. Look, uh, with regard to ASEAN, I, I, I simply want to note uh, and emphasize something I, I, I noted before. If you look at our own Indo-Pacific strategy, and you then look at the ASEAN outlook uh, on the Indo-Pacific, the coincidence of these approaches, these strategies, these visions is um, very, very strong, very, very high. And that speaks to why we do put a premium on ASEAN centrality and why, as Vivian pointed out, um, starting with President Biden, uh, we have uh, had significant engagement, re-engagement uh, with ASEAN over the last, uh, the last two and a half years. Uh, economic growth, inclusive economic growth, uh, transparency, the rule of law, but also work on uh, discrete issues and areas that have a real impact on the lives of people in the, uh, in the region as well as in the, in the United States, whether it's, uh, whether it's climate, uh, whether it's energy, uh, whether it's global health. Uh, all of these are front and center in what we're doing. And one of the things that we talked about today is we, we just spent some time talking about Burma. And of course, that tends uh, in, in ASEAN meetings in U.S. ASEAN engagement, maybe that tends to get the headlines, and it's usually important. But if you look at the uh, agenda that we're actually pursuing, both at the meetings that we have and then day in, day out, it's a very broad universe of, uh, of issues, of subjects, all of which really go to the, uh, the needs, the aspirations, uh, the hopes of people uh, in the ASEAN region uh, and in the United States. So Next watch question. what we do, not just what we say. And you'll see that there's a full range of activities for the United States and its engagement with ASEAN. Next question goes to Jennifer Hansler with CNN. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, on Iran, how would you characterize the ongoing indirect talks with Tehran? Would you say that you're optimistic that an understanding can be reached between the two sides on constraining Iran's growing nuclear program? And then uh, the Omani foreign minister said earlier this week that he believes the two sides are close on a deal for the detainees. Do you agree with that characterization? And then moving on to the China detainee issue, are you committed to raising the case of Kylie, Mark Swedan, and David Lin in your meetings in Beijing? And more broadly to both you, Mr. Secretary, and Mr. Foreign Minister, are you optimistic, given what you said about this not being sufficient, are you optimistic that this will lead the way to continued meetings, continued dialogues between the U.S. and China, including on the military-to-military -military front? Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, with regard to, uh, to Iran, uh, some of the reports that we've seen about uh, an agreement on uh, nuclear matters, or for that matter on detainees, uh, are simply not accurate uh, and, uh, and not true. On the nuclear side of the equation, um, we are determined to ensure that Iran never acquires a nuclear weapon. Uh, we remain convinced that the best way to do that is through diplomacy. Um, we haven't taken any option off the table. Um, you've heard that clearly from the President. Uh, but uh, we continue to believe that diplomacy would be the most effective path forward. But there is no uh, agreement. And reports to the contrary are simply inaccurate. When it comes to our detained citizens in Iran, uh, nothing uh, would please me more than to be able to say that we have an agreement 
that secures their release, but that too would not, uh, would not be accurate. It's something we continue to work on intensely um, on a regular basis, and that's separate and apart from any conversations we, we have on, on nuclear matters, but I'm uh, not in a position to say that uh, we have an agreement. Um, with regard to the, uh, uh, the visit, two things. Uh, one, yes, I will be raising the detainees. This has been an ongoing conversation with, um, with the PRC and something that uh, for me is always at uh, the top of my list, that is looking out for the security and well-being of Americans around the world, including uh, those who are being detained in one way or another, including arbitrarily. More broadly, um, what we're working to do on this trip is to really carry forward what President Biden and President Xi agreed to in Bali uh, at the end of last year, which was to establish sustained uh, regular lines of communication at senior levels across um, our governments, precisely so that we can make sure that we are communicating as clearly as possible uh, to um, avoid uh, as best possible misunderstandings and miscommunications. Because if we want to make sure, as we do, that the competition that we have with China doesn't veer into conflict, the place you start is with communicating. And uh, so we'll see what, uh, what comes from, from this visit, but this is directly in response to what the two presidents agreed in Bali last, uh, last November. Um, and as to what comes next, let's see how the, how the visit goes. I think uh, Vivian uh, said it very well. This is uh, an important, uh, but uh, in a sense, it's a sufficient step because there's a lot of work to, uh, to be done. I'd, I'd, I'd note as well that even as we're trying to make sure through better communications that uh, the competition doesn't appear into conflict, we're also looking at areas where uh, we might cooperate. Uh, in the interests of uh, the American people, in the interests of, uh, of China uh, and its people, but also in the interests of people uh, around the world. One of the clear demand signals that, that we get, uh, including from our close friends and partners, is that both the United States and the PRC will responsibly manage this relationship and look for areas where uh, our cooperation might produce results that benefit not only our own people, but people around the world, including uh, in the region. So we'll be looking at that as well. Well, the only thing I can add there is perhaps a perspective from Southeast Asia. First, if you look 100 years down the road, we see both China and the United States being a clear presence for the century and beyond. Second, we see the United States remaining a Pacific partner and power and stakeholder. We don't want you to go away. And, and we're not. <laughs> Good. Third, if you look at the challenges confronting the world right now, and we've, we've enumerated them, climate, pandemics, uh, cyber, opportunities in outer space, now more than ever, we will need, even as the world transits into a multipolar world, now more than ever, we need a rules-based multilateral system with institutions and processes fit for purpose, updated where necessary. And again, this requires the United States and China to achieve a modest vivendi. So this trip is important, it's essential, but it doesn't stop there. And uh, I think Tony knows the views of all of us in Southeast Asia. The more you travel and engage, the better. And as I said, you know, I'm biased because I, he's a friend and I can think of no better diplomat at this point in time. In this cool, rational, emollient way uh, to deal with some very fundamental differences because the two societies, and here we speak from experience, China and the US are not going to converge and become one identical entity. And the challenge for all of us, both 
mentally, emotionally, and diplomatically, is to hold sometimes contrarian thoughts in one mind. And this is the challenge of the century. Fifty years ago, when Henry Kissinger went to Beijing, it completely reordered the strategic furniture in the globe. Uh, we are coming close to a point when this will be necessary again. So we all watch with uh, interest and concern and some optimism because as diplomats, we all have to be optimistic. Otherwise, you will not keep trying. So let's support these efforts and let's see where you, where you will take it. For the final question, Benji Heyer with Feature Story News. Thank you both here uh, on behalf of Channel News Asia today, CNA. We've heard Washington and Singapore's position on US-China relations. I wanted to ask your perspective on ties between Russia and China. How much is the, what they call the, the friendship with no limits between Moscow and Beijing a concern for the US Secretary of State and Foreign Minister for the Indo-Pacific and ASEAN? Uh, you've heard us uh, speak to this on a number of occasions um, uh, in recent months, uh, and it entirely depends on the practical manifestations of, uh, of that partnership. Or, or that, uh, or that friendship. Um, I'll let uh, China and Russia address <laughs> how they view uh, their partnership. But uh, we've been very clear, for example, um, about the importance of um, countries not providing Russia with the kind of assistance that it can use to advance its aggression uh, in Ukraine. Um, equally, uh, we've been. Uh, open and welcoming of uh, efforts, initiatives of uh, countries, including, for example, uh, China, to try to play a positive role in, uh, in diplomacy that can advance uh, a just and durable peace uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, as it happens right now, there are, I think, um, representatives from six or seven African countries who are in, uh, in Ukraine also trying to advance that proposition. I would note the um, terrible irony of the fact that while they were in Kyiv, uh, more missiles from Russia rained down on the Ukrainian capital. Um, but I'll uh, leave that to others to uh, underscore that particular irony. But uh, as with, uh, again, as with um, uh, many countries, uh, we want to ensure that um, no one is adding fuel to the, this fire of Russia's making. And if uh, countries that, uh, by the same token, can play a positive, productive role, uh, including China, in trying to find uh, a path to adjust and durable peace. That's something we welcome as well. Well, Singapore is a tiny city state. We've only been independent for almost 58 years. So I hope you understand, from our perspective, the UN Charter, international law, and the precepts of sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity are sacrosanct for us. We have no other alternative. And therefore, for us, this invasion you know, is something which we have to take a stand on. And we have. And we, that's expressed in our votes in the General Assembly and also in some specific sanctions that we have taken against Russia. And it's something which we don't do routinely or lightly but it's an expression of how strongly we feel on this matter. I can't speak for China, but I would say that at least in their interactions with us and also in the public statements, China also has affirmed the importance of territorial integrity, independence and sovereignty. And like Tony, I also hope that their efforts will bear fruit. Um, and you know, we, we really have to pray for peace because we know that at the end of the day, you will end up at the negotiating table. But right now, blood is being shed and lives are being lost for perhaps marginal leverage on the negotiating table. And as humanitarians, 
all of us must feel the pain and the tragedy of this situation. And uh, I think we all want peace. When it will be achieved, I don't know. But we all want peace. Thank you. Thank you.